Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 8 Valency did not sleep that night. She lay awake all through the long dark hours, thinking, thinking. She made a discovery that surprised her, she, who had been afraid of almost everything in life, was not afraid of death. It did not seem in the least terrible to her. And she need not now be afraid of anything else. Why had she been afraid of things? Because of life. Afraid of Uncle Benjamin because of the menace of poverty in old age. But now she would never be old, neglected, tolerated. Afraid of being an old maid all her life. But now she would not be an old maid very long. Afraid of offending her mother and her clan because she had to live with and among them and couldn't live peaceably if she didn't give in to them. But now she hadn't. Valency felt a curious freedom. But she was still horribly afraid of one thing, the fuss the whole jam fry of them would make when she told them. Valency shuddered at the thought of it. She couldn't endure it. Oh, she knew so well how it would be. First there would be indignation, yes, indignation on the part of Uncle James because she had gone to a doctor, any doctor, without consulting him. Indignation on the part of her mother for being so sly and deceitful, to your own mother, Doss. Indignation on the part of the whole clan because she had not gone to Dr. Marsh. Then would come the solicitude. She would be taken to Dr. Marsh, and when Dr. Marsh confirmed Dr. Trent's diagnosis she would be taken to specialists in Toronto and Montreal. Uncle Benjamin would foot the bill with a splendid gesture of munificence in thus assisting the widow and orphan, and talk forever after of the shocking fee specialists charged for looking wise and saying they couldn't do anything. And when the specialists could do nothing for her Uncle James would insist on her taking purple pills, I've known them to effect a cure when all the doctors had given up, and her mother would insist on Redfern's blood bitters, and Cousin Stickles would insist on rubbing her over the heart every night with Redfern's liniment on the grounds that it might do good and couldn't do harm, and everybody else would have some pet dope for her to take. Dr. Stalling would come to her and say solemnly, You are very ill. Are you prepared for what may be before you? Almost as if he were going to shake his forefinger at her, the forefinger that had not grown any shorter or less knobbly with age. And she would be watched and checked like a baby and never let do anything or go anywhere alone. Perhaps she would not even be allowed to sleep alone lest she die in her sleep. Cousin Stickles or her mother would insist on sharing her room and bed. Yes, undoubtedly they would. It was this last thought that really decided Valency. She could not put up with it and she wouldn't. As the clock in the hall below struck twelve Valency suddenly and definitely made up her mind that she would not tell anybody. She had always been told, ever since she could remember, that she must hide her feelings. It is not later like to have feelings, Cousin Stickles had once told her disapprovingly. Well, she would hide them with a vengeance. But though she was not afraid of death she was not indifferent to it. She found that she resented it, it was not fair that she should have to die when she had never lived. Rebellion flamed up in her soul as the dark hours passed by, not because she had no future but because she had no past. I'm poor, I'm ugly, I'm a failure, and I'm near death, she thought. She could see her own obituary notice in the Deerwood Weekly Times, copied into the Port Lawrence Journal. A deep gloom was cast over Deerwood, etc., etc. Leaves a large circle of friends to mourn, etc., etc., etc. Lies, all lies. Gloom, forsooth. Nobody would miss her. Her death would not matter a straw to anybody. Not even her mother loved her, her mother who had been so disappointed that she was not a boy, or at least, a pretty girl. Valency reviewed her whole life between midnight and the early spring dawn. It was a very drab existence, 
but here and there an incident loomed out with a significance out of all proportion to its real importance. These incidents were all unpleasant in one way or another. Nothing really pleasant had ever happened to Valency. I've never had one wholly happy hour in my life, not one, she thought. I've just been a colorless nonentity. I remember reading somewhere once that there is an hour in which a woman might be happy all her life if she could but find it. I've never found my hour, never, never. And I never will now. If I could only have had that hour I'd be willing to die. Those significant incidents kept bobbing up in her mind like unbidden ghosts, without any sequence of time or place. For instance, that time when, at sixteen, she had blued a tubful of clothes too deeply. And the time when, at eight, she had stolen some raspberry jam from Aunt Wellington's pantry. Valency never heard the last of those two misdemeanors. At almost every clan gathering they were raked up against her as jokes. Uncle Benjamin hardly ever missed retelling the raspberry jam incident, he had been the one to catch her, her face all stained and streaked. I have really done so few bad things that they have to keep harping on the old ones, thought Valency. Why, I've never even had a quarrel with anyone. I haven't an enemy. What a spineless thing I must be not to have even one enemy. There was that incident of the dust pile at school when she was seven. Valency always recalled it when Dr. Stalling referred to the text, to him that hath shall be given and from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. Other people might puzzle over that text but it never puzzled Valency. The whole relationship between herself and Olive, dating from the day of the dust pile, was a commentary on it. She had been going to school a year, but Olive, who was a year younger, had just begun and had about her all the glamour of a new girl and an exceedingly pretty girl at that. It was at recess and all the girls, big and little, were out on the road in front of the school making dust piles. The aim of each girl was to have the biggest pile. Valency was good at making dust piles, there was an art in it, and she had secret hopes of leading. But Olive, working off by herself, was suddenly discovered to have a larger dust pile than anybody. Valency felt no jealousy. Her dust pile was quite big enough to please her. Then one of the older girls had an inspiration. Let's put all our dust on Olive's pile and make a tremendous one, she exclaimed. A frenzy seemed to seize the girls. They swooped down on the dust piles with pails and shovels and in a few seconds Olive's pile was a veritable pyramid. In vain Valency, with scrawny, outstretched little arms, tried to protect hers. She was ruthlessly swept aside, her dust pile scooped up and poured on olives. Valency turned away resolutely and began building another dust pile. Again a bigger girl pounced on it. Valency stood before it, flushed, indignant, arms outspread. Don't take it, she pleaded. Please don't take it. But why? demanded the older girl. Why won't you help to build olives bigger? I want my own little dust pile, said Valency piteously. Her plea went unheeded. While she argued with one girl another scraped up her dust pile. Valency turned away, her heart swelling, her eyes full of tears. Jealous, you're jealous, said the girls mockingly. You were very selfish, said her mother coldly, when Valency told her about it at night. That was the first and last time Valency had ever taken any of her troubles to her mother. Valency was neither jealous nor selfish. It was only that she wanted a dust pile of her own, small or big mattered not. A team of horses came down the street, Olive's dust pile was scattered over the roadway, the bell rang, the girls trooped into school and had forgotten the whole affair before they reached their seats. Valency never forgot it. To this day she resented it in her secret soul. But was it not symbolical of her life? I've never been able to have my own dust pile, thought Valency. The enormous red moon she had seen rising right at the end of the street one autumn evening of her sixth year. She had been sick and cold with the awful, uncanny horror of it. So near to her. 
so big. She had run in trembling to her mother and her mother had laughed at her. She had gone to bed and hidden her face under the clothes in terror lest she might look at the window and see that horrible moon glaring in at her through it. The boy who had tried to kiss her at a party when she was fifteen. She had not let him, she had evaded him and run. He was the only boy who had ever tried to kiss her. Now, fourteen years later, Valency found herself wishing that she had let him. The time she had been made to apologize to Olive for something she hadn't done. Olive had said that Valency had pushed her into the mud and spoiled her new shoes on purpose. Valency knew she hadn't. It had been an accident, and even that wasn't her fault, but nobody would believe her. She had to apologize, and kiss Olive to make up. The injustice of it burned in her soul tonight. That summer when Olive had the most beautiful hat, trimmed with creamy yellow net, with a wreath of red roses and little ribbon bows under the chin. Valency had wanted a hat like that more than she had ever wanted anything. She pleaded for one and had been laughed at, all summer she had to wear a horrid little brown sailor with elastic that cut behind her ears. None of the girls would go around with her because she was so shabby, nobody but Olive. People had thought Olive so sweet and unselfish. I was an excellent foil for her, thought Valency. Even then she knew that. Valency had tried to win a prize for attendance in Sunday school once. But Olive won it. There were so many Sundays Valency had to stay home because she had colds. She had once tried to say a piece in school one Friday afternoon and had broken down in it. Olive was a good reciter and never got stuck. The night she had spent in Port Lawrence with Aunt Isabel when she was ten. Byron Sterling was there, from Montreal, twelve years old, conceited, clever. At family prayers in the morning Byron had reached across and given Valency's thin arm such a savage pinch that she screamed out with pain. After prayers were over she was summoned to Aunt Isabel's bar of judgment. But when she said Byron had pinched her Byron denied it. He said she cried out because the kitten scratched her. He said she had put the kitten up on her chair and was playing with it when she should have been listening to Uncle David's prayer. He was believed. In the Sterling clan the boys were always believed before the girls. Valency was sent home in disgrace because of her exceedingly bad behavior during family prayers and she was not asked to Aunt Isabel's again for many moons. The time cousin Betty Sterling was married. Somehow Valency got wind of the fact that Betty was going to ask her to be one of her bridesmaids. Valency was secretly uplifted. It would be a delightful thing to be a bridesmaid. And of course she would have to have a new dress for it, a pretty new dress, a pink dress. Betty wanted her bridesmaids to dress in pink. But Betty had never asked her, after all. Valency couldn't guess why, but long after her secret tears of disappointment had been dried Olive told her. Betty, after much consultation and reflection, had decided that Valency was too insignificant, she would spoil the effect. That was nine years ago. But tonight Valency caught her breath with the old pain and sting of it. That day in her eleventh year when her mother had badgered her into confessing something she had never done. Valency had denied it for a long time but eventually for peace sake she had given in and pleaded guilty. Mrs. Frederick was always making people lie by pushing them into situations where they had to lie. Then her mother had made her kneel down on the parlor floor, between herself and cousin Stickles, and say, Oh God, please forgive me for not speaking the truth. Valency had said it, but as she rose from her knees she muttered. But, oh God, you know I did speak the truth. Valency had not then heard of Galileo but her fate was similar to his. She was punished just as severely as if she hadn't confessed and prayed. The winter she went to dancing school. Uncle James had decreed she should go and had paid for her lessons. How she had looked forward to it. And how she had hated it. She had never had a voluntary partner. The teacher always had to tell some boy to dance with her, and generally he had been sulky about it. 
Yet Valency was a good dancer, as light on her feet as thistledown. Olive, who never lacked eager partners, was heavy. The affair of the button string, when she was ten. All the girls in school had button strings. Olive had a very long one with a great many beautiful buttons. Valency had one. Most of the buttons on it were very commonplace, but she had six beauties that had come off Grandmother Sterling's wedding gown, sparkling buttons of gold and glass, much more beautiful than any Olive had. Their possession conferred a certain distinction on Valency. She knew every little girl in school envied her the exclusive possession of those beautiful buttons. When Olive saw them on the button string she had looked at them narrowly but said nothing, then. The next day Aunt Wellington had come to Elm Street and told Mrs. Frederick that she thought Olive should have some of those buttons, Grandmother Sterling was just as much Wellington's mother as Frederick's. Mrs. Frederick had agreed amiably. She could not afford to fall out with Aunt Wellington. Moreover, the matter was of no importance whatever. Aunt Wellington carried off four of the buttons, generously leaving two for Valency. Valency had torn these from her string and flung them on the floor, she had not yet learned that it was unladylike to have feelings, and had been sent supperless to bed for the exhibition. The night of Margaret Blunt's party. She had made such pathetic efforts to be pretty that night. Rob Walker was to be there, and two nights before, on the moonlit veranda of Uncle Herbert's cottage at Mistawi's, Rob had really seemed attracted to her. At Margaret's party Rob never even asked her to dance, did not notice her at all. She was a wallflower, as usual. That, of course, was years ago. People in Deerwood had long since given up inviting Valency to dances. But to Valency its humiliation and disappointment were of the other day. Her face burned in the darkness as she recalled herself, sitting there with her pitifully crimped, thin hair and the cheeks she had pinched for an hour before coming, in an effort to make them red. All that came of it was a wild story that Valency Sterling was rouged at Margaret Blunt's party. In those days in Deerwood that was enough to wreck your character forever. It did not wreck Valency's, or even damage it. People knew she couldn't be fast if she tried. They only laughed at her. I've had nothing but a second-hand existence, decided Valency. All the great emotions of life have passed me by. I've never even had a grief. And have I ever really loved anybody? Do I really love mother? No, I don't. That's the truth, whether it is disgraceful or not. I don't love her, I've never loved her. What's worse, I don't even like her. So I don't know anything about any kind of love. My life has been empty, empty. Nothing is worse than emptiness. Nothing. Valency ejaculated the last, nothing, aloud passionately. Then she moaned and stopped thinking about anything for a while. One of her attacks of pain had come on. When it was over something had happened to Valency, perhaps the culmination of the process that had been going on in her mind ever since she had read Dr. Trent's letter. It was three o'clock in the morning, the wisest and most accursed hour of the clock. But sometimes it sets us free. I've been trying to please other people all my life and failed, she said. After this I shall please myself. I shall never pretend anything again. I've breathed an atmosphere of fibs and pretenses and evasions all my life. What a luxury it will be to tell the truth. I may not be able to do much that I want to do but I won't do another thing that I don't want to do. Mother can pout for weeks, I shan't worry over it. Despair is a free man, hope is a slave. Valency got up and dressed, with a deepening of that curious sense of freedom. When she had finished with her hair she opened the window and hurled the jar of potpourri over into the next lot. It smashed gloriously against the schoolgirl complexion on the old carriage shop. I'm sick of the fragrance of dead things, said Valency. Chapter 9 Uncle Herbert and Aunt Alberta's silver wedding was delicately referred to among the Sterlings during the following weeks as, at the time we first noticed poor Valency was, a little, you understand? 
Not for worlds would any of the Sterlings have set out and out at first that Valency had gone mildly insane or even that her mind was slightly deranged. Uncle Benjamin was considered to have gone entirely too far when he had ejaculated, she's dippy, I tell you, she's dippy, and was only excused because of the outrageousness of Valency's conduct at the aforesaid wedding dinner. But Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles had noticed a few things that made them uneasy before the dinner. It had begun with the rosebush, of course, and Valency never was really quite right again. She did not seem to worry in the least over the fact that her mother was not speaking to her. You would never suppose she noticed it at all. She had flatly refused to take either purple pills or red ferns bitters. She had announced coolly that she did not intend to answer to the name of Doss any longer. She had told Cousin Stickles that she wished she would give up wearing that brooch with Cousin Artemis Stickles' hair in it. She had moved her bed in her room to the opposite corner. She had read Magic of Wings Sunday afternoon. When Cousin Stickles had rebuked her Valency had said indifferently, Oh, I forgot it was Sunday, and had gone on reading it. Cousin Stickles had seen a terrible thing, she had caught Valency sliding down the banister. Cousin Stickles did not tell Mrs. Frederick this, poor Amelia was worried enough as it was. But it was Valency's announcement on Saturday night that she was not going to go to the Anglican church any more that broke through Mrs. Frederick's stony silence. Not going to church any more. Doss, have you absolutely taken leave, oh, I'm going to church, said Valency airily. I'm going to the Presbyterian church. But to the Anglican church I will not go. This was even worse. Mrs. Frederick had recourse to tears, having found outraged majesty had ceased to be effective. What have you got against the Anglican church, she sobbed. Nothing, only just that you've always made me go there. If you'd made me go to the Presbyterian church I'd want to go to the Anglican. Is that a nice thing to say to your mother? Oh, how true it is that it is sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child. Is that a nice thing to say to your daughter? said unrepentant Valency. So Valency's behavior at the silver wedding was not quite the surprise to Mrs. Frederick and Christine Stickles that it was to the rest. They were doubtful about the wisdom of taking her, but concluded it would make talk if they didn't. Perhaps she would behave herself, and so far no outsider suspected there was anything queer about her. By a special mercy of Providence it had poured torrent Sunday morning, so Valency had not carried out her hideous threat of going to the Presbyterian church. Valency would not have cared in the least if they had left her at home. These family celebrations were all hopelessly dull. But the Sterlings always celebrated everything. It was a long-established custom. Even Mrs. Frederick gave a dinner party on her wedding anniversary and cousin Stickles had friends in to supper on her birthday. Valency hated these entertainments because they had to pinch and save and contrive for weeks afterwards to pay for them. But she wanted to go to the silver wedding. It would hurt Uncle Herbert's feelings if she stayed away, and she rather liked Uncle Herbert. Besides, she wanted to look over all her relatives from her new angle. It would be an excellent place to make public her declaration of independence if occasion offered. Put on your brown silk dress, said Mrs. Sterling as if there were anything else to put on. Valency had only the one festive dress, that snuffy brown silk Aunt Isabel had given her. Aunt Isabel had decreed that Valency should never wear colors. They did not become her. When she was young they allowed her to wear white, but that had been tacitly dropped for some years. Valency put on the brown silk. It had a high collar and long sleeves. She had never had a dress with low neck and elbow sleeves, although they had been worn, even in Deerwood, for over a year. But she did not do her hair pompadour. She knotted it on her neck and pulled it out over her ears. She thought it became her, only the little knot was so absurdly small. Mrs. Frederick resented the hair but decided it was wisest to say nothing on the eve of the party. It was so important that Valency should be kept in good humor if possible, until it was over. 
Mrs. Frederick did not reflect that this was the first time in her life that she had thought it necessary to consider Valancy's humors. But then Valancy had never been queer before. On their way to Uncle Herbert's, Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles walking in front, Valancy trotting meekly along behind, Roaring Abel drove past them. Drunk as usual but not in the roaring stage. Just drunk enough to be excessively polite. He raised his disreputable old tartan cap with the air of a monarch saluting his subjects and swept them a grand bow. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles dared not cut Roaring Abel altogether. He was the only person in Deerwood who could be got to do odd jobs of carpentering and repairing when they needed to be done, so it would not do to offend him. But they responded with only the stiffest, slightest of bows. Roaring Abel must be kept in his place. Valancy, behind them, did a thing they were fortunately spared seeing. She smiled gaily and waved her hand to Roaring Abel. Why not? She had always liked the old sinner. He was such a jolly, picturesque, unashamed reprobate and stood out against the drab respectability of Deerwood and its customs like a flame-red flag of revolt and protest. Only a few nights ago Abel had gone through Deerwood in the wee SMAs, shouting oaths at the top of his stentorian voice which could be heard for miles, and lashing his horse into a furious gallop as he tore along prim, proper Elm Street. Yelling and blaspheming like a fiend, shuddered Cousin Stickles at the breakfast table. I cannot understand why the judgment of the Lord has not fallen upon that man long ere this, said Mrs. Frederick petulantly, as if she thought Providence was very dilatory and ought to have a gentle reminder. He'll be picked up dead some morning, he'll fall under his horse's hoofs and be trampled to death, said Cousin Stickles reassuringly. Valancy had said nothing, of course but she wondered to herself if Roaring Abel's periodical sprees were not his futile protest against the poverty and drudgery and monotony of his existence. She went on dream sprees in her blue castle. Roaring Abel, having no imagination, could not do that. His escapes from reality had to be concrete. So she waved at him today with a sudden fellow feeling, and Roaring Abel, not too drunk to be astonished, nearly fell off his seat in his amazement. By this time they had reached Maple Avenue and Uncle Herbert's house, a large, pretentious structure peppered with meaningless bay windows and excrescent porches. A house that always looked like a stupid, prosperous, self-satisfied man with warts on his face. A house like that, said Valancy solemnly, is a blasphemy. Mrs. Frederick was shaken to her soul. What had Valancy said? Was it profane? or only just queer. Mrs. Frederick took off her hat in Aunt Alberta's spare room with trembling hands. She made one more feeble attempt to avert disaster. She held Valancy back on the landing as Cousin Stickles went downstairs. Won't you try to remember you're a lady, she pleaded. Oh, if there were only any hope of being able to forget it, said Valancy wearily. Mrs. Frederick felt that she had not deserved this from Providence. 